mercies of God. In other words, because of God's mercies. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Because of God's mercies. Paul is saying, God is saying to us, consider his mercies. Consider my mercies towards you. Mercy, what is mercy? Mercy is forgiving the sinner and withholding the punishment that is justly deserved. As the Bible tells us, we were all born in sin. Romans 3 and 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we know that's because of the poor decision, the awful decision that the first man and woman made years ago that we read about in the book of Genesis. When they chose to disobey God, when they chose to disobey God, it caused mankind to be corrupted. So everyone born after them was born in sin. But because God is merciful, he gave us a chance to come to him, to surrender to him, and to be forgiven of our sins so we wouldn't suffer eternal damnation. And even, and, and, and this word is for, especially those of us who are saved, those of us who have already accepted Jesus, consider the fact that you are here right now because of God's mercy. And even after you got saved, even after you accepted the Lord, think about the times when you messed up. Think about the times when you disobeyed God. Think about the many times that you fell and God picked you back up. Aha! He withheld the punishment that you really deserved for your actions. Now you may have suffered some consequences because we do suffer consequences for our choices. But understand that it could have been a whole lot worse. Words, what am I talking about? Hail. You know, overseer Shirley Kyle, when she was here last Sunday, she talked about that either last Sunday or next Saturday. But I know last weekend, I heard her address that. We talk about heaven and we should. We should look forward to it. But we have to remember that there's also a hell. And hell was not designed for us. God does not want us to go there. But unfortunately, people send themselves there when they choose to reject him. So, so any suffering, any consequences that you may endure because of choices, it doesn't compare to what could happen. Because the suffering, I'm talking about suffering here on earth, right? Suffering here on earth is not hell. Even though people lose, use that word loosely, oh, it's hot in now, I'm hot right now, but it ain't hot as you know what. <laughs> I have enough sense to know better than that. Therefore, I'm not making that statement. Oh, I've been going through, you know what? No, you have not. You might be suffering, it might be hard, but it doesn't compare to the hell that the Bible talks about. And we have to remember that even when we suffer here on earth, it's only temporary. Woo, Shabbat, Yelavoko, say. Woo, Jesus. It's only temporary, especially those of us who are in God because He gives us the strength to go going through. Amen. And we will eventually come over on the other side, come out on the other side. But hell is forever. It's eternal. And think about what forever means. We don't know what forever means. We don't. We know what it means, but we haven't experienced forever yet. Forever means it will never end. So consider the mercies of God. That he gave you another chance, and another chance, and another chance, and another chance. Consider his love, consider his grace. Grace is God's favor toward the unworthy. I hear people say favor ain't fair. No, it's not. You're right, because you didn't deserve it. Shabo, Ika, Rabba Kose. I don't deserve favor. God's goodness, his kindness on the undeserving is grace. 
We are saved because of God's grace. We couldn't have done enough to be redeemed for our sins. That's why back in the Old Testament, when they offered the animal sacrifices, it only covered the sins temporarily. Because there isn't enough that we could do. Who shut all crusades? So we know as John 3.16 tells us, God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. He allowed his son to be killed on a cross in our place. In our place. He didn't just sacrifice on our behalf. He died in our place. Think about it. That should have been me on the cross. That should have been you on the cross. Being killed. Being humiliated. Being stabbed. Being beat. Being knocked. I said But because of God's love. And because Jesus loves us. He was willing to lay down his life. Consider the mercies of God. Keep that in the forefront of your mind. Yes, Lord, don't take it for granted. I admit that I've taken it for granted. Verses 15 and 16. 
And it says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in all manner of conversation. And conversation means in everything you do. Right. Verse 16, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Who is holy? God is holy. In my study, I came across a gentleman by the name of Henry C. Thiessen. I don't know if anyone's ever heard his name before, but he was a Christian educator and author during the 20th century, so a long time ago. But I like how he explained the holiness of God. He said, God is absolutely separate from and exalted above all his creatures and creation. And he is entirely separate from all moral evil and sin. When we, when you and I accepted Jesus into our hearts, he forgave us of our sins, hallelujah. He cleansed us. He made us new as if we had never sinned in the first place. So now we are to live holy. Be holy for I am holy. We are to live separate from the evil and sin around us. We are not to be like people in the world. You say, don't be like the world. That means the people in the world who don't follow Christ. We're not to be like them. We're not to blend in. But we're to be separate. And, and to, to explain that, imagine a person who lives in a neighborhood where a lot of crime goes on. That person's neighbors, they do illegal stuff to make money. But that person makes an honest living. You know, they follow all the rules, all the laws of the land. They do everything right. So although that person lives amongst criminals, they don't act as a criminal. Because inside they're not criminals, that's not who they are. So they choose to be true to who they are. We have to be true to who God made us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. New. All things are passed away. That old life is passed away. And all things are become new. We're not the same. So we can't act the same. We can't talk the same. We have to be different. God has called us to be extraordinary. Hallelujah. Hmm. We must live our lives in a way that is acceptable to God. We have to be intentional about it. Yeah. Please turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. We have to be intentional as children of God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. And Philippians was another letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians that were living in Philippi. And this is what he said, and this applies to us. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes. Intentional, what does that mean? Done on purpose, uh -huh. deliberate. Here in Philippians 2 and 12, the Apostle Paul was telling the Christians there in Philippi, you've got to work out your own salvation. And that applies to us. We have to work out our own salvation. We each are responsible for what we do. Amen. We each are responsible for the choices we make. Even when we got saved, that was an individual decision. Yeah. Those who know me know that I've been in church all my life. And I thank my mom for raising me and my brother in church. But even being in church, going to church every Sunday, learning, memorizing scriptures, memorizing the books of the Bible yeah. from Genesis to Revelation. Remember that? Uh -huh. <laughs> Remember that, Sylvia? Yeah, so every August, we had to get up and recite some scriptures and then the books of the Bible in our classifications from Genesis to Revelation. What? And we would get a trophy. But even with all that, even with my mom teaching me how to pray and praying with us at home before going to bed, even with all of that, I still had to make the decision to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. 
And then even after accepting Jesus, I had to make a decision to develop a relationship with him, to pursue him, to draw nigh to him. My mom couldn't do it for me. She could only teach me. She could only pray for me and live the life before me, which is what she did. So again, the Apostle Paul was telling the Christians in Philippi, work out your own salvation. Check this out. Even when I'm not with you. See, it's easy to act the part when we're at church, when we're around our spiritual leaders. We know how to talk. We know how to clap. We know how to dance. Oh, I practice my dance. As a teenager, I want to shout like that. So I, I, I practiced at home and I would do it at church. And I kept doing it and kept doing it. And then one day the Holy Spirit took over. So when you see kids playing, let them play. Let them play. Let them pretend to speak in tongues. Let them pretend to shout and be happy. And one day, whoo, shago. Because I'd rather that they play, that they pretend, play church here than doing other stuff out there. Amen. So we know how to play the part here, right? But what about when we go home? What are we doing behind closed doors? It is still our responsibility to be holy before God. Amen. God has called us to a higher standard of living. Amen. Again, the Apostle Paul said, work out your own salvation. He said, with fear. In other words, with the highest regard for God. It should be our goal every single day to live for God, to obey his voice. Because we highly regard him. And it says with trembling, we should always consider our actions, our conversations, and our thoughts. Understanding that God sees and hears everything. He hears our thoughts. Because God, I can just be thinking something and God will give me an answer and I didn't even open my mouth. I've shared this before, back in 1990 when I was in the 10th grade, I, I had the pleasure of meeting my, I call her my shoe, Olympic champion woman, Rudolph, the, the first American woman, not the first African American woman, the first American woman, I like to say that, to win three gold medals in an Olympics. My, our former track coach ran track with her back in the day. And they were still good friends. A woman was in town to visit her. So they came over to Fairfield High School. And we didn't even know that she was coming. And I had the opportunity to sit next to her in the stands. Because she said she would sign my autograph or sign an autograph for me after the track meet. Okay. Now I'm about to follow you up here. I'm about to sit right next to you. You and your grandson. And that's what I did. And while I sat there, I was careful of what I did. I was careful of what I said because I didn't want to do or say anything that might offend her or that I thought might offend her. She didn't say anything. She, didn't, she was very nice. She was very down to earth. She wasn't intimidating or anything like that. But because of who she was to me, because I honored and respected her and admired her so much, I was on my best behavior. That's how we must be for God. Amen. Although I admire Mama Rudolph, she didn't do anything for me. She was a role model, yes. An example I could follow about never giving up. Amen. Believing in the impossible. Here was a, a woman who was told that she would never be able to walk. Who had polio and didn't start walking until the age of four. And when she was walking, she had to wear leg braces. So I think she was somewhere maybe around 11, 12 before they were finally taken off. Then she became a basketball star and a track star. And by the age of 15, she was running the 1956 Olympics. But she didn't start walking until she was four. But there was something that she said. She said, the doctor said I would never walk, but my mother said I would. So I believe my mother. So I admired that, and I can admire that. Woman didn't do anything for me other than that. She didn't save me. She didn't forgive me. She doesn't provide 
for me. She doesn't protect me. Wherever I go, I think about God always protects me. I could go on and on about the goodness of God, but I'm going to keep it moving. So we have to have that same attitude with God. God, I, 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 I admire you. I, 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 I regard you. I, I love you so much. I want to honor you, God. I want to please you, God. Yes. And so we have to make the decision to live for God on purpose. Paul said, work out your own salvation. Let's, let's think about the word work. Most of us in here have a job, right? And when you go to that job, you go and work. You do whatever the company hired you to do. Now there are days when you don't feel like going, right? You have to push your way out of bed, but you get up and you go. And then even when you get there, you don't feel like it sometimes. You wanna just play on your phone or, or, or sneak somewhere and take a nap. Hmm? So you don't, you work. You do what you have to do. Why? Because you know that you need that job in order to get paid. You know you need to get paid because you have bills and family, your family to take care of. Maybe you're looking for a promotion. Maybe you're looking for a raise. So you know you have to be on your best in front of your supervisor. You want your supervisor to be impressed with you, with your work ethic, with your effort. Hmm? And you are intentional because you want the rewards. You work on purpose even when you don't feel like it because you want the rewards. Well, check this out. I got some news for you. God has rewards that far outweigh anything your job could do. And if we were to be real, you have the job because of God. He gave you the ability. He gave you the right words to say in the interview. He helped you with your resume. He gave you intelligence. He gave you the skills that you possess, the gifts that you possess. You didn't just, woo, just appear out of the sky like, woo. I got here all by myself. No. Oh, God deserves all the credit. So if we can be intentional for our supervisors, for our parents, for our pastors, that we should that much more be intentional for God. See, we can't operate out of our emotions because I've been guilty of that. If I don't feel like obeying the Lord, if I feel like doing something else instead, I want to please my flesh, then I just go with how I feel. Even though I know what the Bible said, I go with how I feel at that moment. But we don't operate out of our emotions. We operate out of faith. Amen. Romans 1.17 says that the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. When you are intentional for God, it's because of your faith in God. Amen. Huh? Because you believe him, because you trust him, because you love him. When God tells you to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and pray, but you're sleepy, and you know you have to give it a few hours to go to work, you get up. Because of your faith. Amen. Because you believe God. Oh, yeah, no, say there's a reason why you want me to pray, so I'm going to do it. I may not feel like it, but I'm going to do it because you said so, God. And I'm committing my way to you. Amen. When God tells you to give a special offering in church, you do it. Because you believe God. There's a reason why you wanted me to do it. Yeah. And it may not even be because you're going to return it. Amen. Because the house just needs it. When God tells you to turn off the TV and worship me, woo, even though your favorite program is on, you turn it off and you worship. Amen. Ah, you know, oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Whatever you want me to do, God, yes. Lord. You're intentional. Ah, you know, oh, Kosianda. Again, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Youth Pastor Day Box ministered on reasonable service at the last youth service. 
your reasonable service. Reasonable meaning fair, sensible, appropriate. Because of God's love for us, it's only fair. It's only appropriate that we serve him. <laughs> and my own interpretation of reasonable service is, it's the least I can do. I'm still here. You didn't let me die in my sins. You didn't let me lose my mind when the enemy was trying to make me have a mental breakdown. So it's the least I can do. You protected me time and time again. You kept me from I don't know how many car accidents because of irresponsible drivers on the road. Service. 
We owe God our devotion. I'm going to read one more scripture and I'll bring it to a close. 1 Samuel 15 and 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Those of you who know me, you know I'm a radical praise her, right? Well, I used to be, y'all think I praise now. When I was younger and, and, and weighed less and had a lot more of that youthful energy, Oh, I jumped the whole service. <laughs> so we can, we can praise him. He wants us to praise him. Right? Doesn't he? he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Yeah. He wants us to praise him when we come in here. But what means more to him than that is obeying him. Living for him. Amen. Honoring him in everything that we do. The New Living Translation interprets reasonable service as it says it like this. This is truly the way to worship. Living for God. That is the truest form of worship. Amen. Now, yeah, he still wants us to praise him and to lift our hands. <laughs> but it means that much more when we're living a life that is submitted to him. So when we lift our hands and we're living a life that is submitted to him, oh my God. He comes down and he slow dances with us. Hey! Because we prove day after day that we love him. We prove day after day that we honor him. Even when no one is watching. Even when we're by ourselves. Lord, I love you. Lord, I honor you. Lord, I praise you. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I'm not going there. Thank you for the invitation. But no, God has called me to a higher standard. And I want to please him. Because if it weren't for him, I would be dead. If it weren't for him, I might be in prison. If it weren't for him, I would be in hell. Be intentional for God. Live for God on purpose. Hey, do it because you just know you're supposed to. Forget how you feel. Get out of your feelings. That's what that really means. Get out your feelings. Get out your feelings. Get out your feelings. Be intentional for God because as Travis Green sings, God is always going to be intentional for you. Before I take my seat, if there's anyone who wants to give their life to the Lord, you heard something today and you realize, yeah, I'm a sinner. Or maybe you stepped away. I'm ready to come home. I haven't been living right. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. I'm ready to resubmit my life to the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. Mm, hallelujah. Anyone else? Even anyone who may be looking online, I'm talking to you too. You don't have to be here in the house of God. I got saved after watching the play. I won that church. You can get saved in your house. You can get saved in the car. You can be saved in the parking lot like those young men did yesterday. Well, if there is no one else, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you all to please stand because I want us to all pray this prayer together. Ronnie, right? Let Ronnie know that he is not alone. Shout 
believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. So please repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. That you were buried. But you rose again for my liberty. Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart. Come into my life. And save me. Heal me. Deliver me. And I will serve you forever. Thank you, Lord. Praise. 